In every generation, pastors have faced the same temptation to draw a crowd by preaching what people want to hear rather than preaching the gospel. Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg urges us to stay rooted in truth in spite of pressure that comes from the culture. This is the conclusion of our study titled Useful to the Master. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, because of the crazy environment in which he is ministering, he must continue to preach the Word of God, and he must be sure that he doesn't lose his spiritual theological equilibrium. Isn't that what he's saying there in the opening phrase of verse 5? And this is the second imperative. First, preach the Word. Secondly, keep your head. It would be so easy for the prospect of Paul's departure, coupled with the itching ear syndrome, to knock Timothy completely off his balance. And so he issues this strident call to him. In Scots, keep the heed. Keep the heed. The danger is that when we need to be steady and stay awake, when we need to be calm and we need to be cool, uh, we begin to flap and go crazy and annoy everyone around us. And so this is a wonderful word of encouragement to all, particularly perhaps to some whose heads are being spun There's a more successful ministry, apparently, in relationship to size down the street. And the Word of God comes and says, Now, listen, just keep your head and do so in all situations. That will involve enduring hardship. If Timothy was going to continue to refuse to compromise on the basis of truth, if he was going to uphold these principles of biblical certainty in an age of confusion, then he was going to suffer hardship. And when the biblical principles become unpopular, the temptation arises, especially for a young man in ministry, to downplay the factors which cause offense. He says, make sure you don't do that. Keep your head in every situation in the situation of hardship. Make sure, secondly, that you are involved in evangelism, that you're doing the work of an evangelist. D.E. Hoff said, I would not appoint a man or a woman to the mission field unless they had first learned to wrestle with the evil one. For if they have not learned to wrestle with the evil one, then they will wrestle with their fellow missionaries. In other words, when a church loses sight of the battleground, loses sight of the overarching objective to see unbelieving people become committed followers of Jesus Christ, when that note goes then there will be all kinds of things that come in to take its place. And they won't all be bad, but they won't be the best thing. And we reminded ourselves yesterday that the Bible is a book about salvation, and Timothy is to be committed to proclaiming the good news. And in doing this, he must discharge all the duties of his ministry. In other words, don't shirk all the different bits and pieces. There are all kinds of things involved in pastoral ministry. Not all of them are those for which we are immediately prepared. They don't all attract us in the same way that others do. But that's true of everybody's job. There are few people who like everything that they do every day. He says, now don't run away. Leave nothing undone that you ought to do. The environment around you may tempt you to silence or to compromise— You may find that it dulls your spirits, that it weakens your resolve. But let me, he says, urge you on all the more. The tougher the times, the greater the public disinterest, the more diligent we need to be in keeping our heads and fulfilling the task. Now, the reason, he says, that Timothy must act in this way, he gives the explanation beginning in verse 6. Because I'm on my way out being poured out like a drink offering. I've fought the fight. I've finished the race. Timothy, you're going to have to take the next lap. You notice the juxtaposition between the opening two words of verse 5 and the opening two of verse 6. But you for I. This is absolutely explicable. It's not difficult, this at all. If you're studying it in English, you just need to understand the English language. But you for I. You can read Numbers 15 for your homework, and there you will read of the drink offering, a final act in the sacrificial ceremony that brought a closure to all that had gone before. Paul picks up on that when he writes to the Romans and he urges them, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And now he says, that's essentially where I am. 
I don't think that my second defense is going to go better than the first. I think I'm probably out of here. He was talking in realistic terms, but he says, it's my departure that's coming, and my life is just passing away. I'm pouring it out now like a drink offering. It's a wonderful illustration of the Christian's view of death. The word here for departure, analusis, is a word that was translated variously in contemporary Greek usage. It would be the word that would be used of a farmer unshackling his oxen from their yoke and allowing them to uh, roam in uh, uh, relaxation. The word that would be used for striking a tent and heading for a permanent dwelling. The word that would be used for weighing anchor and heading to that final harbor that was our destination. Paul says, that's it for me. I'm going to be striking tent and uh, heading for my permanent dwelling. There's no sense of grim desperation here, is there? There's no sense of agonizing over it. He's in a dismal dungeon. And yet what a wonderful reminder to us that God has made of death for the Christian a narrow sunlit strip between the goodbyes of yesterday and the hellos of tomorrow. The death for the Christian, what we fear most, we never experience. We're going to fall asleep in the arms of Jesus, and we're going to wake up, and we'll be at home. And the sun will be shining through the windows, and we will hear our Father's well done. So therefore, that event holds no terror for the Christian. What it will mean for us in the eking out of our lives may be painful. I'm not sure I like the prospect of the process. But let us learn here from Paul. I'm going to be departing, he says. And in light of that, he looks back over his shoulder. And he says, I've fought the good fight. And I've finished the race. And I've kept the faith. What a wonderful thing to be able to say. Timothy could underscore it. He knew that Paul had struggled on many occasions. The metaphor is a good one. The glorious fight that God gave me, I fought that. The course that Christ set me, I ran that. It underlines for us the steady persistence that is involved in Christian living. For Paul, since his coming to Christ, it had not been a few 40-yard sprints. It hadn't even been a cross-country run. It had been a, a marathon that was going on right until he breasted the tape. He was pressing on towards the goal to win the prize for which God had called him heavenward in Christ Jesus. And he had been a guardian and a steward of the gospel. He had kept the faith in the way that he now urges Timothy to do. He had retained his own personal faith and trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus as he now urges Timothy and us through this letter to do. And so from there he looks forward in verse 8. Verse 6 is the present tense. Here I am. This is my experience. Verse 7 is the past tense. There I was. And verse 8 is the future tense. And this is what I'm looking forward to. A crown. Not his exclusive expectation. But rather the expectation of all who have been justified through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They and he long for the appearing of the one from whom the unbeliever will hide in shame. He's looking forward to a crown. Nero may be about to declare him guilty, but he looks to the Lord who is the righteous judge. This Nero character, he may send me to the guillotine, but the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And his testimony of faith in three tenses there in 6 and 7 and 8 serves as an encouragement to Timothy, to whom he now gives a further and final word of instruction, which reveals the sensitivity of his heart and the intimacy of his friendship. Finally, he says, do your best to come to me quickly. That's the imperative, come to me quickly. All through this letter, we've sensed the ties that Paul feels to this young man, Timothy. And if he's ever to see Timothy again, he says, you need to come to me soon. Presumably his concern about the winter is that if he didn't reach him before the winter, then the difficulties of travel would probably prevent his coming. And three times he mentions about him coming. You can look through and find that. It's not difficult to sense from the words here an almost tangible loneliness on the part of the Apostle Paul. 
in a dismal dungeon, separated from the opportunities that were previously his, no longer able to fulfill the things that he is exhorting his young lieutenant to, and aware of the fact that people have been leaving him all over the place, some for reasons of ministry, Crescens and Titus. Certainly that would be true of Tychicus. But the real blow had been struck by Demas. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. If you read the New Testament, you will discover that Paul and Demas had been close. They'd been related to one another. You can read of that in Colossians 4 and in Philemon. But now he was gone. Paul doesn't say, well, que sera, sera, whatever, doesn't matter. I've got a few left, so what if Demas left? No, there is a deep sadness in his life. And it would appear that the desertion was somehow directly related to Paul himself. Demas has deserted me. There was a personal element to it. And in ministry, these things are hard and these things are sad. And you sense the sadness what was it that called for Demas to do this bunk? Was he afraid? Was it a relationship with a woman? Did he fall in love with today and lose the sense of the then? We don't know. But he stands out as an individual who represents discouragement to the servant of God at a time when his greatest need was for encouragement. Remember. We're leaving a legacy. The desertion of Demas is more than matched by the loyalty of Luke. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. That's the good news and the bad news. The good news is Luke is with him. The bad news is only Luke is with him. Where are the rest? Our dear friend Luke the doctor, as he refers to him in Colossians 4. In Philemon 24, he's referred to again as our fellow teacher. There's no indication that this chap, Luke, was a great evangelist or an effective Bible teacher. But he was loyal to the Lord Jesus. He was loyal to the servants of Jesus. He was loyal to the gospel. And in his capacity as a Christian doctor, he made a powerful contribution to the kingdom by way of the kindness of his heart. And I say to you again, kindness will live on in the hearts of men and women long after mental cleverness and eloquence has been forgotten. Don't desert like Demas. Be loyal like Luke. And don't let's forget the ministry of Mark. Don't you love this? Get Mark and bring him with you. Pardon, Paul? Isn't this the character you blew out earlier on? You said, you can take Mark anywhere you like, but he's not coming with me. Didn't you say that, Paul? Yes, I did. Were you right? Well, well, let's just say he's helpful to me in my ministry now. Okay, we'll take that as a concession. What a wonderful encouragement is contained here. That God is a God who turns defections into blessings. That he is the God who nerves the feeble arm for fight. He turns the pain of failure into the privilege of usefulness. All of us have done a mark at some point on the journey, I'm sure. How wonderful that God does this. Now, verse 13 is an interesting verse, and I'm, we're, now, we're now very close to the flaps going down. When you come, he says, bring the cloak, bring my skulls, and, and especially the parchments. Now, there's a couple of things here. First of all, here is the spiritual giant, and he wants his jacket. Also, bring my scrolls. You see the humanity of the guy? That's how we feel. Hey, could you bring me a book? Dear mom, please send me my anorak. And if you can drop by at the campsite, I would love to see you. And all the more so because he recalls the antagonism of Alexander, the metal worker, who was more of a hindrance than a help. And he says, the Lord will take care of him. I'm going to commit my cause to him who judges justly, but I need to mention him because I want you to be on your guard against him, not because he was opposed to Paul as a personality, not because he didn't like uh, the way Paul did things, 
but because he strongly opposed the message of the gospel. That is the great concern, loved ones, in our day. It's not a personality conflict. It's the issue of the gospel. We need to warn God's people against those who strongly oppose the gospel, whether it's politically correct or not. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. I'm not going to go further than that. I will commit my cause to him who judges justly. But I need to warn you, Timothy, because the character's on the prowl. And he opposes the gospel. Not only had he been opposed by Alexander, but he had been unsupported in his first defense. That's what he says in verse 16. The preliminary hearing that went before the formal trial had been an occasion of desertion. But he wasn't embittered. Look at that lovely sentence. May it not be held against them. In other words, there's no spirit of resentment, disgruntlement. It's not, I remember what he did to me then. I know this. You see, you see this distinction between his mention of Alexander probably pained him because the only reason he would mention him by name is was because he was opposing the gospel. There were many others who did all kinds of things to him that were personally related. But he doesn't mention their names. In fact, he says, when I think about them, may it not be held against them. Because after all, the Lord stood at my side and he gave me strength. What a lovely word. The enablement was for a purpose so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. And the Lord has kept me safe. And the Lord will rescue me, verse 18, from every evil attack. I was delivered in the past. I'm kept in the presence. I'll be delivered in the future. And he's going to bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. So to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And just when you're closing your Bible, he goes on and does another little section as you turn the page. Look at these people here. I love all these names. I can't wait to meet them. Remember that old song there? You have heard of little Moses in the bulrush. Remember that one? You have heard of fearless David and his sling. You have heard a story told of Dreaming Joseph and of Jonah and the whale I often sing. And there are many, many others in the Bible. And I should like to meet them all. I do declare and by and by the Lord will surely let me meet them at that meeting in the air. Because there's going to be a meeting in the air. Oh, I almost started singing there. (laughs) But that's only in case of a fire. (laughs) I want to meet Puddins, don't you? Puddins, was this the real name or a nickname? Was this somebody who liked desserts? I don't know. (laughs) Puddins. Puddins and one sip Horace, they're going to be there. I'm going to see the two of them. What you have here are not Smarties or refreshers. You've got all sorts here. (laughs) And the point is simply this, as wonderful as is to Paul the presence of the Lord Jesus, and as wonderful as is the prospect of the return of the Lord Jesus, both his presence with me and the prospect of his coming for me is not intended to be a substitute for the joy of human friendship and fellowship. We need one another. And if you have no idea what your ministry is to be in going back, you go back and just look out some folks and make it your plan to drop a note or give a call or write or drop in or whatever it is. Because this is a little reminder to us of the way fellowship works. Priscilla, Aquila, Nesiphorus' guys, Erastus, Trophimus, sick in Miletus. Pardon? You left him sick in Miletus? Miracles of healing were not at the command of their performers. Human experience and the biblical record make it perfectly clear that there are reasons in the divine counsel of God for a believer's sickness as well as for a believer's health. And to teach other than that is to teach from an empty head and a closed Bible. Now let me finish by pointing you to two phrases. 
Verse 22, the final phrase, grace be with you. And the final phrase of verse 18, to him glory. Let me summarize it in this way. From him grace and to him glory. Timothy, you're needing to be useful to the master. Don't be ashamed. Aim for God's approval. Continue in the faith. Keep your head intact. Don't deviate. Be kind to everyone, patient, tender-hearted, and so on. Just run the race to the finish. And that's my word to you. Let us run the race to the finish. Some have already finished their race. As I had my colleagues and mentors sign my book this morning so that I would remember having been here when I'm old and cold and settled in my ways. I looked across the page, and there the, the lovely signature of dear John Cager, whose memory is a fragrance to us all and a challenge to finish the race. And all of us could fill in other names, not simply from here, but around us. And now to us, the final 200 meters. I love Eric Little's answer. When interviewed by the Edinburgh Evening Post after his success in the 400 meters in the 1924 Olympics in Paris, what they said to him was your success in running the 400 meters. Well, he said, I ran the first 200 as fast as I possibly could. And then with God's help, I ran the second 200 even faster. To those of you who were born a little earlier, don't buy this notion that the future of the church is in the children. You are the future of the church. Your theological grasp, your experience of God's faithfulness, your laying hold of God in prayer is undergirding the very framework into which another generation comes. And so then let us press on from him the grace and to him all the glory. Passing the gospel to the next generation. That's the call for every pastor and for every believer. You're listening to Truth For Life with Alistair Begg. Every day here, our goal is to teach the truth of God's Word. That's it. And we know that as we do that, God's Spirit works to convert unbelievers, to establish believers in their faith, and to strengthen local churches. So when you give to this ministry, you're helping make all that work possible. To say thanks for your support, we have selected a book that we think will be helpful to you, especially if you are a pastor or an elder or a leader in your local church. Specifically, this book provides biblical guidance for counseling those who are affected by addiction. It's written by Christian counselor Ed Welch, and the title is Addictions, Finding Hope in the Power of the Gospel. If someone you love is struggling with an addiction, we want to recommend this book. And we invite you to request a copy when you donate today. Ask for Addictions by Ed Welch when you call 888-588-7884 or request your copy of the book online at truthforlife.org. I'm Bob Lapine for Alistair Begg and all of us here at Truth For Life wishing you a restful weekend as you worship with your church family. And remember, if you're looking for a way to supplement your study time over the weekend, you're invited to join Alistair and the congregation at Parkside Church via the live stream that's available Sunday mornings at 945 Eastern Time. Learn more at truthforlife.org slash live and then join us back here again Monday as we begin a new study of the Gospel according to Mark. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.